<laughs> I have one at the end of the lecture. No. Sort of my class when nobody shows up for the same quiz. <laughs> It's recording already? Yes, it's recording right now, so. Okay. okay. I can get out of your way. I'll, I'll be in the office for a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Hey, guys. Hello. Early lecture. It's 8.30. Somehow I got up. or something? postdoctoral researcher with uh, Professor Glenn Dane. I just finished uh, my PhD in December last year. Um, feel free to stop me anytime and ask questions. This this is an hour long lecture. What? Oh. Okay. So I've got about four, 50 good slides, uh, some extra slides. I'll I'll skip through some. But just stop, stop me whenever you need to, or even you can ask questions afterwards. So here's the basic outline of this uh, presentation. Start with overview of the welding technology. You guys all would know most of it. Uh, motivation of why collision welding is important and why we do it. Uh, the mechanism for all types of collision weldings. Uh, the different types of methods we have at hand for doing this. Uh, explosion welding is the most common or the most popular one. Magnetic pulse welding is also quite popular. Vaporizing foil welding is something that uh, we developed in our lab uh, and we have a patent on it. Laser impact welding is all is actually being is done is done in EJTC. Huimin Wong works on it and Professor Lippold and Professor Dane has a uh, patent on that. And then we'll end with a summary of what we have talked about, standard. Okay, so technology, there's, uh, there are different types of welding that you can have, solid state welding, solid liquid state, liquid state. In this, in the solid state welding we is what we are uh, interested about in this class. And as you all know, there's friction welding, uh, hot forge welding, cold welding, diffusion welding, and friction stir. In the cold welding again, there is pressure, high velocity or collision and ultrasonic welding. And in the high velocity or impact welding, there are different subcategories. This slide is taken from uh, 
Yuan Jiang, who was, who was another uh, PhD from our group. And at that time, we didn't have vaporizing foil on. So we have explosive welding, magnetic pulse welding, laser impact welding, and then the new one, the vaporizing foil welding. So with impact welding, we it, we get hardly any heat affected zones. There are no filler materials required. Uh, there is ability to bond similar as well as dissimilar materials. As you all know, it's difficult to weld, weld dissimilar materials because of different melting points. And uh, with collision welding, we can melt dissimilar uh, weld many dissimilar material combinations. As many as uh, I think the last count was about 260 different combinations can be welded using uh, explosive welding. Uh, joints generally tend to have greater strength than the base metals if the process is done right. It's a fast welding process. Uh, that's a very general, uh, general thing that I'm saying. It's, it depends on, there's a lot of time for setting up, but setting up the process, but once you press the button, everything happens really fast and within microseconds. Uh, flexible to weld geometry depends on the type of welding, type of uh, collision welding we are doing as well. Uh, there is high reliability and reproducibility, uh, especially for explosion welding. The newer process, obviously, there is a lot of work that needs to be done to ensure reliability or reproducibility. There are challenges. Uh, there is not a clear guideline uh, on the optimal conditions as there are new processes being developed as we talk. Um, Spatial and temporal temperature distribution is not fully understood yet. Um, it's such a fast process that uh, even computational methods are not uh, still not as good, uh, still not good enough to really predict the temperatures. There are some predictions, but how close are they to the actual values? It's not understood uh, well enough. Uh, also, because these processes are occurring at such high strain rates, there are uh, constitutive properties which are not well understood for different materials. At high strain rates, materials behave differently, and there are models which, uh, which predict the high strain rate behavior, but how reliable they are, there is a lot of debate on that. So all that is a challenge. Uh, so what, what really happens? In, uh, in the collision welding is w there's one, there's a target plate, uh, as we see here on the bottom. We have the target plate and it is, it is collided, uh, it is impacted by a flyer plate. You could have multiple flyer plates to have welding between uh, multiple plates, but here we have a case of one plate to another. They impact at very high velocities. Uh, the the target plate collapses onto uh, the, uh, the flyer plate collapses onto the target plate. There's a very high pressure because of impact. The right at the pressure over here for a cost impact of about 400 per second. We have gigapascals. So at these these high pressures, it is known that materials can behave as fluids. Uh, solid mat materials can even behave as fluids for a very short time, and we can give, get waves in materials, uh, shock waves in materials, and uh, very high plastic deformations can happen at these high strain rates. So the basic mechanism, this, this is based on the works by the authors below, mainly Barani and Al-Hassani. This is the basic mechanism. We can, I think we don't need to get into great details yet, but uh, you can see the basic process. It's, I don't know if you guys have heard of shape charges before. Any of you heard of shape charges? Uh, it's basically collision of two, uh, two metal or one metal plate onto itself or two metal plates and basically the material in between them, the surface of those get sheared off and that ejects from, the, from in between and that's called a jet. Now that jet cleans all the surfaces and presents uncontaminated surfaces towards each other at really high pressures. 
And when that happens, you can uh, you can get atomic bonding between them because this jet is basically removing the oxide layer uh, from both the surfaces. And as a result of this whole mechanism, waves are formed. So if you see an interface uh, interface uh, of with waves with wavy characteristic, then you know that some jetting happened, and uh, it's generally a good weld. There, the most important factors that uh, that determine whether a good happen and the collision velocity. Those are the two important factors. Uh, there, there's a certain welding window. That's what we call it, uh, over which waves will waves will form and a good weld will form. So here's again a diagram showing the basic process. This is the target, the flyer. The jet comes out from between, cleans out the surfaces, presents uncontaminated surfaces, uh, uncontaminated surfaces, and atomic bonding happens. Okay, this is a typical weld interface. This is a steel welded with copper. Actually, this was a tube to tube, uh, tube to a mandrel, and we see this wavy interface. You know, and steel are very compatible actually, so they form a very good bond between each other. Uh, we don't have to get into the details of this. This is the basic geometry. If we if we have some velocity of welding, we can predict what the velocity of the collision was, and also predict the angle of collision. And uh, from that, we we determine whether something is within whether a process is within the welding window or not. Okay. So the first type of uh, collision welding and the most popular one. I think most of you here have would have heard of this uh, is explosive welding. Uh, this is I think this was uh, discovered quite quite a while ago, but uh, but how but it started being applied in the 60s and the 70s. This is this basically has a target plate, the explosive above a clad material or the flyer plate, and as the detonation wave. Passes through the explosive from one the the slide to the base, and the waves are formed. And this is the basic process that a lot of the theory of collision welding is based upon. Uh, here are some equ equations. Actually, I just want to talk about that really fast. Uh, explosion above it is. Uh, can be calculated quite accurately now. Uh, it's called the Gurney. It's the, called the Gurney velocity based on energy. E dash E prime is actually the Gurney energy of any particular explosive. Generally, uh, there's a company called Data uh, Dynamic Materials Clad Corporation. They are based in Boulder, Colorado, and they are the biggest producers of explosive cladding. And they have a plant in Erie, Pennsylvania, and they use ammonium nitrate fuel oil mixture uh, mixed with some sand or perlite. Uh, and so, basically, different explosives have different Gurney energies. So, based on a specific parameter of and the mass by charge. So, mass is the mass of the plate. C is the mass of the explosive. We can actually predict the velocity of a plate. Uh, the velocity of the velocity of an explosive. Every explosive has a characteristic de detonation velocity. TNT, I think it has a detonation velocity of, as far as I can remember, is five kilometer per second. Anfo, with the sand and uh, ammonium nitrate fuel oil, is called anfo, uh, mixed with sand or perlite, has detonation velocity close to 2.5 kilometer per second. So uh, the, the collision velocity as the basically the how fast this also be estimated. This is all based on the geometry on the previous slide, which is not very difficult to understand. You'll have the lecture, so if you want to look it over, you can, you're most welcome to investigate. Okay. There are various parameters which are important and whether, I don't know how much uh, needs to be talked about in this particular case, but 
Flyer plate velocities are generally in the range of uh, 300 to 800 meters per second, and uh, yeah, different explosives like PETN or ANFO are generally used for for welding. There's a very good paper that I mentioned here, uh, Akbari Mosavi bond strength of explosively bonded specimens. If anyone is interested on in learning about the computational side as well as experimental side of uh, explosive welding, I can pass that paper on to you. Okay, the weld interface for explosive welding looks uh, very much like the characteristic baby the interface that I forget, but I, that that's clearly aluminum to copper. This is steel to copper and the other is the flyer and the steel as the target. Uh, I don't I don't remember, but yeah, you can basically weld lots of combination, lots of pairs using explosive welding and uh, get this wavy interface. Getting that wavy interface is uh, very important. And that's a clear, wavy interface is a effect of jetting. So if we get that, we know that jetting happened and jetting is a necessary condition for a clean, clean interface to form. Okay. So as we as we know, there's this all this is happening at really high pressures, and we can get you can get a lot of plastic deformation, and that plastic deformation can also sometimes heat up the material to cause intermetallic formation. Here is an aluminum copper weld. I don't know how well you can see. Yes. Uh, mapping of the interface uh, across hardly any metallic right you can see however if these intermetallics are not continuous it's a good thing because even if those are brittle. There is, a, if there is a ductile phase in between, those brittle phases would not affect it that badly. If there was a continuous, more or less continuous, uh, brittle phase in between uh, the the pair, then you can imagine a crack can really traverse through the interface and cause failure. So I think this weld is good, but we'll see some examples of bad welds at a later stage. Okay, so dynamic materials is dynamic. Yeah, dynamic DMC is one of the biggest manufacturers, and you can see the pro products that they make are pretty large scale. Here is uh, I brought some trinkets. So here's a aluminum. It's just applied to us by DMC, a small one. But you can see most of the welding that is done is at about centimeter scale. Uh, the, 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 the plates are of centimeter scale. The, the whole product that is made is almost uh, really large scale. So there are some issues with explosives, clearly. Uh, for example, there's difficulty in handling. There are safety regulations, which are more increasingly stringent. There are... Uh, uh, Explosive welding has to be large scale. It, it is very difficult to scale it down. Uh, there is something called the critical diameter of an explosive or the critical volume. So basically, uh, when an explosive has to detonate, it has to basically sustain that detonation because of its own inertia. Otherwise, it will just splatter around. Right. So there is a, a certain volume of explosive that needs to be detonate, that needs to be applied. Otherwise, it won't detonate. Uh, we had the DMC guys uh, over, over in our lab last month, or maybe a couple of months ago, and the, a small shot for them, a small, uh, the test shots for them is 70 pounds of ANFO. That's, that's, and, and you can imagine, uh, if you want to compare that to something, then uh, in, within a closed inter industrial setting, not more than 10 grams of explosives allow, are, are allowed. So 70 pounds of explosive is a, a standard test shot for them. What they 
really do for product manufacturing is about 200 pounds of and for that's a lot of energy about four, four kilojoules don't quote me on this but yeah about four kilojoule of energy per gram of ANFO so you can 200 pounds of ANFO is I don't know megajoules gigajoules so yeah there's a it has to be a large scale operation the tools must be very tough because these are high impact high uh, pressure impacts and uh, the two tool lives have been unpredictable okay so next we'll go into magnetic pulse welding which is a smaller scale welding uh, and can be done in lab and is done around the world we do it here uh, there's a lot of work going on in Germany and Belgium the Belgian Belgian welding Institute uh, they do a lot of work on magnetic pulse welding and uh, this these next few slides will be based on uh, Yuan's work uh, she finished her PhD in 2010 from our group she also worked she, but Dr. Babu was also a co-advisor. So magnetic pulse welding, uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of this, but it's based on the principles of uh, electromagnetic induction, Faraday's law, Lorentz law, I don't know if you guys have still remember that, but basically if you have a, uh, let's draw it. Maybe not. Anyways, so if you have a uh, transient current going through a primary coil, primary circuit, and you say you place another circuit, uh, another piece of metal around it, then that will induce, if that current is transient or if it is a varying current, that, then that induces a secondary current in the, in the other, in the metal, right? And this is the principle of transformers. Now, if that uh, those currents obviously are uh, opposite to each other and opposite current carrying conductors repel each other, right? So these conductors will repel, repel each other and if one of the conductors is stationary, then the other one has to move or there will, there will be a lot of force for, on it uh, for it to move and that can basically launch a piece of metal at really high velocities. Uh, so basically there is a capacitor bank which is charged up to a very high voltage uh, which discharges through a, a coil which we call the primary coil and a workpiece is placed around the primary coil which which is launched at a high velocity. These, this workpiece can be in the form of a sheet or in the form of a tube as we'll see here. This is a tubular tubular welding process the magnetic field is varying and that causes currents to be induced in the, the tube inside the solenoid. Uh, that, that tube repels from the solenoid and impacts onto a, another, work, another work piece which is the target plate and can weld. Obviously we have to provide a certain angle. It, the impact has to be oblique uh, with respect to the inner work piece otherwise welding would not occur. Um, so yeah. There's a few capacitor banks in Europe. This is an example of circular axis, axisymmetric welding. Uh, yeah, very. So you have the flyer tube, the target rod, the actuator. If this impacts at an angle, we form a weld. The, again, this this impact has to be within the welding window. The velocities and the impact angle have to be within that win window otherwise welding would not happen. The jetting would not happen and then the welding would not happen. Bar actuator, this is uh, Yuan's work. Uh, you ha this is for launching uh, launching flat sheets of metal. There's an in ingoing current and there's an outgoing current that repels the plate here and that impacts with the target which is kept at a certain standoff distance. The standoff distance is what determines, what helps uh, accelerate, gives the room for the flyer plate to accelerate and also provides a, an impact angle. 
both of which are necessary for welding to happen. Okay, so Yuan did some work with uh, different angle actuators uh, because that can that can help create the angle, five degree, ten degree, up to thirty degrees. Uh, and basically, if we vary the uh, vary the input energy that goes into the actuator, we can vary the velocity of launch as well. So she varied that, and uh, so that's the method. Another method of launching plates is uh, the uniform pressure actuator. There is a I can be, go through this real fast. Is uh, there's a coil, a solenoid coil, a flat solenoid coil on the inside, and here's the outer conductor. Above that, if you place a, a metallic sheet, now if you place a metallic sheet and have high enough pressure, then that forms the secondary coil. Stop me if, if you do not get it, but that forms the circuit around the around the primary coil, which is on the inside. So when there's a current going on the inside, there will be a current going on in the metallic sheet, which is kept above it. The eddy currents are opposite to the primary current, and that repels the uh, repels the repels the workpiece towards the target plate and causes welding. The the standoffs were provided by embedded. Room for acceleration as well as the stand, as well as the angle for impact, and she welded uh, different uh, different materials using that. Uniform pressure actuator was also developed in our group. Uh, Kristen Banik did some work. Manish Kamal did some work in, in back in back in the days, not really back in the days in 2008. I started in 2007, so it's not in, not back in the days. Okay, so we have uh, we have a system to measure velocities. It's called the photonic Doppler velocimeter. It's based on photons, a laser, and the Doppler effect. If you have a moving object and you reflect a electromagnetic radiation off of it, or any wave out of, off of it, then the frequency of the wave or the velocity of the reflected wave is different from what we send in. And if you interfere those you create beats, and the frequency of those beats are proportional to the velocity of the moving object. So that's the principle of PDV. Uh, I can show that to you if you if you want. Come come visit our lab. Um, so yeah, we me she measured measured the flyer velocities as the flyer collapsed onto the target. We also did some simulation work. Okay. That's the principle of PDV here. Velocity is up to 300 meters, 275 meters per second is what she measured. The currents are in the range of 150, 100 to 150 kiloamperes. There are a lot, there's, so there's a lot of current that's flowing through, but in a very short time. So it's a lot of energy in a short time, so very high power, high power density experiments that happen here. Impact angle calculation, I can go through that. Get that. So she welded. Uh, she tried to weld a lot of different materials in the lab. Uh, this this is a welding of uh, 6061 T6 condition aluminum alloy with with itself at different energy levels. The strength of the material, strength of the joints, clearly increased with the input energy. The tenth, the lab shear testing of these samples clearly uh, showed that the failure occur. The weld zone, the weld zone here is, is here, and upon uh, lab shear testing, it all this failed outside. Uh, it failed in the parent material. The what else needs to Okay, peel testing was also done, and. Uh, Most of the peel testing resulted in the failure through the base metal rather than through the interface, so that's a good weld. The mechanical testing, also nano indent, she did nano indentation and micro hardness testing, and clearly the the hardness of the uh, weld couple had was the highest at the weld, weld interface, as we can see here. This is for aluminum to aluminum joint. 
Okay. Okay. Some UBSD work. This this basically uh, this slide is here to basically show that there's a high big deal, a uh, great deal of uh, grain refinement at the interface. Now we also know. I don't know you. Uh, we, we most probably know, right? Uh, if we have smaller grains, the material is harder, hall patch relationship. So grain, great degree of grain refinement occurs at the interface, and that uh, also increases the strength of the strength of the weld. There is a so much plastic deformation occurring in a very short time, so that pumps in a lot of dislocations, uh, which also. Uh, Strengthen the strengthen the interface. There is a cellular structure of the dislocations which form, uh, which the dislocations spin with each other and they cannot move and hence increase the hardness of the weld interface. Here is the copper 110 to copper 110. Uh, again, the failure occurs outside the weld region. And as we increase the input energy, this is the energy supplied from the capacitor bank. As we increase the input energy, it was seen that the weld, uh, the strength of the weld tends to increase. Peel testing, similarly, the, the fracture always happened, except for one case. At l really low en energies, the fracture happened through the interface, but at higher input energies, higher input electrical energy, the failure happened in the in the base metal. Nano indentation also gives similar results that the 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 hardness in the uh, interface region is higher than the parents. There's a lot of twinning that happens uh, in the interface or even around around the interface. And copper is a FCC material, so it doesn't want to twin that easily, but at really high strain rates because this whole thing is happening at high strain rates, the twin formation, the formation twins have to form uh, in order for plastic deformation to occur. Lambda structure, peeling. Okay. So this is, again, micro hardness also showed similar results of the interface being harder. This TM work that she did, uh, that she wanted, and a uh, lot of green refinement along the interface was observed. Okay, lot dislocation density increased, and that led to higher hardnesses. So, summary of the P and uh, the magnetic pulse welding work. Uh, it was found to be feasible for similar and dissimilar materials welding. Uh, joint interface has greater hardness than the parent materials, than the base metals. Local melting and intermetallic formation can occur. It was seen uh, for dissimilar material welding, especially because the velocities here are not in the optimal range. The velocities are 250 meters per second. We want those velocities to be about 350 to 400 meters per second. So suboptimal. Uh, conditions can lead to intermetallic formation. The joint strength can increase due to grain refinement, high dislocation density, and cellular structure formation. Okay. So, magnetic pulse welding uh, obviously helps to bring down the process, bring down the collision process to a lab scale, and uh, do things at, inside a lab or a closed industrial environment. But there are some problems with magnetic pulse technology, and these have been long-standing. The main is it needs a coil which needs to survive through high pressures and high temperatures. If the cycle time for every pro every single shot is really low, then the coil has to heat up. There's no way around the joule heating, and the pressures are obviously very high for short times. And if there's any f uh, failure, uh, any failure of the insulation material, then that's quite catastrophic for the coil. Because once a spark can start going through the coil, then it can ruin the coil right away. As we can see here on the right side, uh, this was a 
coil that saw a pretty dramatic failure. Uh, there's frequent inspection of the tracks and voids is needed to ensure that efficiency of actuator stays and it doesn't fail. And uh, fabrication of the coil is generally an expensive process. So we have a process called the vaporizing foil welding technique. It's not just used for welding. Uh, we are also using it for forming, uh, for embossing, uh, and other high other, other impulse metal working processes. But here we'll concentrate just on the welding part of it. It's very similar to explosive welding, except that it doesn't use explosives, and it can be done in a lab scale. What it uses is, and it also uses similar equipment, what we use for magnetic pulse welding. So it uses a capacitor bank with uh, the circuit here is shown here. Instead of Instead of having a uh, coil or a solenoid coil, we have a thin piece of metal in the form of a foil or a wire. And when the current, when the high current is passed through that foil, uh, that thin, thin conductor, just in, just like the fuse, it wants to melt. But if that current is really high, and uh, uh, that current is really high, then instead of melting, that conductor will sublimate and basically uh, create a very high pressure region around it. So here's, it, here's what happens. Current is shown in green. The voltage is shown in red. The, when the current uh, reaches a certain value, the, the, the conductor has to vaporize, and the energy which goes into the conductor by the time it bursts is calculated by this integral called the action integral. It's simply the power, U is the voltage, I is the current. So I, I dot V dt integral is the input energy into the conductor before it vaporizes it. It has been found that this input energy can be much higher than the boiling uh, enthalpy of the material. So all this input energy has to go somewhere other than boiling. So it goes into creating that kinetic energy of the gases as uh, as they evolve from the bursting of the conductor. So here's the process of uh, how this is used for welding. The foil is placed above a solid block of steel. Above the, above the foil has to be insulated from everything. Uh, otherwise, this process would not, uh, would not be efficient. The flyer plate is placed above. has a certain standoff from the target plate that we want to weld to. Obviously, that standoff helps create, uh, create the angle, the oblique angle of impact. Then the target plate has to be backed by a steel block. If the target plate is not thick enough, then it has to be backed by a heavy block of steel. And the whole assembly is clamped together with nuts and bolts. Obviously, this is a uh, bench prototype. If this was to be applied in an industry, this can be put inside presses and things like that. So the, the actuator here is basically a foil in the form of a dog bone. Uh, we are still working on uh, optimizing the shape of this. But the basic dog bone shape is to ensure that the current density in the narrowest region of this foil is the highest. We want the launch or the active this foil, and this is this will happen first because it has the highest current density. Okay, so here are some nice uh, schematics that Stephen Hansen, a new student in our group, made. Uh, he won. He actually won the uh, second prize in the Hayes Research Forum recently with these nice schematics. So, oil used to be. It doesn't weld with the target plate. That's because the flyer is launched vertically, and there's hardly any angle between the target and the flyer plate. And it has it has seen every time that there's no welding in this region where the the, the former region of the foil. The welding happens outside that, and wavy interface is many times observed. Uh, this is a new process, and we are in the process of developing this and testing. The basic peel testing setup is here. Uh, Uh, this is what we 
we use right now, a tensile test machine, just to extend this uh, flyer plate away from the target and record the force and displacement curve. Okay, so from from the ex uh, these are some these are the this is the overall montage of the experiments that we have done or we would like to report. Sorry. Sorry about that. Okay, so the experiments were all done at the same input energy, uh, the same input energy from the capacitor bank of about 6.4 kilojoules. 6.4 kilojoules is like 6,400 watt light bulbs lit up for one second. Uh, this is welded at the same energy, so no optimization was done at uh, this particular energy and same standoff, same geometrical parameters, same geometrical and electrical parameters. All operations were attempted for, to be welded and to our, uh, and it was encouraging to see that all of them were welded after the experiment was done. The strength of the welds, however, were very different. Some of the welds, for example, the copper steel and the copper titanium welds were really good in terms of strength, in terms of the peel strength, whereas the other ones like copper aluminum, co uh, titanium steel and the magnesium aluminum welds, although welded, they were not as strong in peel, uh, as you can see here from the nice histogram curve that, or the bar graph that Steve made. So the, the stronger welds are related to wavy interface. In the copper steel, the interface was had some defect. This was very clean and uh, hardly any intermetallics formed. Whereas the copper aluminum, we saw that there was almost a continuous region of molten, uh, resolidified region which led to formation of intermetallics. And the, the, the weld was very weak as well as brittle. The titanium steel welds also had continuous regions of voids and intermetallics along the interface and the magnesium aluminum also had similar problems. And the, uh, some more work was done with the titanium steel after the peel. We looked at it under the surface, uh, under the SEM to do surface EDS and we saw that there was clear, uh, uh, there was clear transfer of materials from one side to other. The, the, uh, the the crests of the tr uh, the crests of the waves were uh, mostly had the other other materials. So this is the titanium side, and the green, yeah, the titanium side, and the green is the iron. And we see that the iron is on top of these waves. On the iron side, we see that the titanium is on the bottom of these waves. It's really clear for that. Okay, just some. Just some preliminary work that's going on. Uh, for the for the for for the combinations that do not weld that well, there's a way around it. So it's called interlayers. So if you em employ a layer which is compatible with both the sides, then you can basically weld and create welds which are much stronger than if just the two layers were welded. So the titanium steel welds had peel strengths of about. Uh, 5 newton per meter, newton per millimeter, whereas obviously this is force. And so the, 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 it was seen that the, the peel strength increased almost four times if we employed a nickel interlayer, and the interface was clean and almost free of intermetallics as well. This is work being done uh, by Bert, who is another new PhD student in our group. Okay. And again, the energies required for this is also very small, like 7.2 kilojoules, not, not, not too high. Photon dot uh, PDB was done uh, for three of the flyer plates that we have employed, copper, aluminum, and titanium. This is the basic setup for it. It's a focuser which...
comes up. The titanium plates have uh, gone up to velocities of up to 560 meters per second. Copper is so soft that it cannot resist the resist moving, and it lets out the plasma much before, and hence also it is very dense. So it goes up to velocities of only 350 meters per second. Aluminum flyers, although strong, although light, are not that strong, and they they also let off the plasma fast, and hence the the velocities are in the range of 450 meters per second. Again, let me go back to the magnetic pulse welding. We can, it has been very difficult to get to those velocities with these materials, uh, with magnetic pulse welding. We have clearly surpassed that uh, using the vaporizing foil technique. Also, magnetic pulse welding needs a conductive material, a very conductive material. The efficiency of the process depends on the conductivity, whereas in this case, we can launch anything. Uh, it doesn't have to be conductive. Uh, I don't know if this will play. The videos never play. Never mind. So this was just a lab shot of me and Andrew doing some some experiments. <laughs> I can play that later on. Anyway, so another the last method that uh, that's also uh, in house at OSU is laser impact welding. Um, Hui Min Wong is the main person work in our group working on this. Uh, Glenn, uh, Professor Dane and uh, Professor Lepold have a uh, patent on this recently. So the, the basic technique here, I'm not sure if I'll go over time, but I'll try to hurry up. So the basic technique here is a uh, pulsed laser which impinges upon a flyer plate. Now the flyer plate has to have some kind of uh, ablative layer above it. So, can you see in the back here? So if this is the flyer plate and this is the laser coming here, then what we basically do is put some paint, some sort of paint, even the Sharpie marker paint would work. Put that paint here, cover that with some mass of transparent material. You can cover it with water, with uh, glass or some polycarbonate sheet. So that mass provides a inertial restraint. Now when this laser comes in, a pulsed laser comes in, it comes through the transparent material and wants to basically ablate that paint because it, it is absorbing that energy, right? If there's a very high power density, very high intensity, and that layer is ablated. It has to go somewhere, but since it is backed with some inertial restraint, the only, way, only place it can go is to push it finds the path of, path of least resistance, so it pushes that flyer plate at a high velocity. That flyer plate, obviously, with the, la with the laser we have, cannot be very, uh, very thick or very heavy. So, women's been welding uh, flyer plates of maybe two thousandths of an inch thick pieces, uh, thickness. Okay. This is the laser, the continuum laser in the lab. I think a couple of couple of blocks this way. Energy is three three joule. Wavelengths of thousand, about thousand nanometers. These are the specifications of the NDAG laser that we have. It is upgradable to eight joules. So the energy is very small, but it happens over a really small time as well. So the energy density is very high, or the power is really high. Um, so it can be used in different configurations. We can have a flat target plate. We can have it at an angle to create the oblique angle of impact, or we can have a groovy target plate to provide uh, different uh, angles of impact. Launch of a 150 micron thick aluminum plate. We see here at about three joules. This is this is the dome shape that comes out from the flyer. This is without any target plate. Right. This is the process I was just talking about here. Glass and flyer. Okay, so here's the interesting part. The velocity of the flyer goes from zero to about 800 to 1,000 meters per second within 
0.12 microsecond. So within 10 nanoseconds, this 150 micron thick aluminum sheet can be accelerated to 1,000 meters per second. And that's the beauty of this particular process, that it happens. You hardly need any standoff distance for acceleration of the plate. It accelerates the peak velocity really fast. So this is for 25 micron thick aluminum, sorry. Okay, here is some high speed video, or the pictures from a video at different times. At the zero, zero microsecond, obviously there's, uh, there's no picture here because the whole spectrum gets overtaken by the flash that happens from the laser ablating the surface of the, the ink. Nickel on nickel, There's not much to talk about here. There's severe local plastic deformation. Uh, in the deformation region, obviously because of this very high velocity impact, you can create really tremendous pressures and that can lead to severe plastic level, local plastic deformation. Almost materials start, solid metals start flowing like liquids for a very short time and severe local plastic deformation occurs. Uh, Related surfaces. This process is uh, for doing lots of experiments. Uh, we have developed a process for basically progressing these coupons at some uh, frequency. This laser, I think, can work at 10 hertz. So you can do 10 shots every uh, every second and basically progress that sheet on. Anyways, this can be progressed at, uh, there can be X and Y co control of the sheet as it progresses and laser will impinge upon each, uh, each coupon and weld with the target plate. So here's the actual picture. So this is, this is, this was all done within a minute. Uh, right. So within a minute you can do all these experiments at different energy levels if you want to control it. So, depending on the distance of the of the flyer plate from the laser, you can control the spot size, right? So, if you have the flyer plate at a certain distance, you can control the spot size and hence control the, the intensity or the power density of the laser. So, this is what uh, Huemin did. At 2 millimeter spot size, really high uh, uh, power density, she got welding through all of these at four millimeter spot size. There was some uh, upon peeling. We she saw that there was no welding and or weak welding in some of the cases. Whereas with six millimeter spot size, it, it it was even weaker. The welds tend to have a uh, tend to be in the form of a perimeter uh, instead of a spot, and that's again because right where the laser, uh, uh, right where the laser launches the uh, the work, uh, the flyer piece, there is flat impact or non-oblique impact. So no welding occurs in that particular region, but there is welding which happens around that region, wherever the wherever the velocities and the angles become optimal and come within that welding window that we talked about earlier. Typical uh, typical waves are observed. The, the wavelengths and the amplitudes of these waves are different than the large scale process, larger scale processes, and this is something that uh, is undergoing study right now. So overall, uh, I would like to summarize here now real quick. Uh, an oblique high velocity impact of two, material, two plates can, two or more plates can result in jet formation and high amount of plastic deformation thereby creating a solid state well between the between the plates if the process is suboptimal if the if uh, if the process is happening outside the welding window then intermetallics and other defects can form so you have to be careful about the velocity and the and the impact angle to make sure that the welding happens uh, and the, the the weld created is good enough with explosion welding is the most popular method for collision welding but it is difficult to scale down and apply in the standard lab uh, in, or industrial settings. Uh, OSU has the capability. We have 
uh, cooperation with DMC as well, but we are capable ourselves to do the other three types, uh, the uh, magnetic pulse welding, which is also done around the world, uh, vaporizing foil welding, which which was developed in-house. Uh, we have a pat patent on that. And uh, lithium, uh, not lithium, uh, laser impact welding, uh, which Professor Lippold and Dan as well as have patents on. Uh, magnetic pulse welding can be applied. It's a, a very clean process and it, it can be applied, if applied well, it is a clean process. Uh, it can be applied for flat as well as cylindrical geometries. Uh, it was seen by uh, uh, Dr. Yuan Zhang that strengthening can be provided by dislocations, grain refinement, interlocking waves, and substructures within the grains. Vaporizing foil welding again. Uh, it's a variation of explosive welding without using explosives and can be done in lab or uh, safe lab environments. Uh, various combinations have been welded. The optimization of those processes have to be still have, are still to be done. Uh, but the early signs are that this uh, process can be really important and uh, is seeing a lot of attention. Strong welds were associated with wavy interface, which were free of intermetallics, whereas weaker welds had many defects. Uh, velocities of up to 560 meters per second were observed using PDV. And uh, I don't know, you can you can come up. There are some more samples here. But welds up to 50 millimeter long uh, were produced using this, have been produced using this vaporizing foil technique. Uh, laser impact welding, it's it's a much smaller scale. Uh, some millimeter, perimeter welds between similar and dissimilar materials can be created with energies as low as three joules. Uh, I put these slides together really fast, so it's actually three joules. Uh, it can be up, upgraded up to eight, eight joules. Our, our laser can be upgraded up to eight joules. And the flyer plates reach peak velocities of up to 800 meters per second within 10 nanoseconds. So that's the beauty of laser impact welding. So with that, let me try to play that. I don't know if it will play, but... That's the boom box that we do our with present for this means that here <laughs> here flat. All right. And Andrew and Steve is invisible here. But yeah, this is uh, the process. If any of you are interested, most welcome to come over to our lab in McQuig Lab three forty eight or email me at vivek dot four. Uh, I'll be happy to show you around and answer any questions. And there are some samples up here if anyone wants to take a look. Thank you.